Hi guys, what is up? Welcome back to Ride With Me. Today, I'm gonna to give you a quick tour and a look at my current daily driver, which is a 2006 Saab 9.3 convertible. As you well know, Saab went out of business a very long time ago, um, but I think that the, the brand was very unique and a lot of people still have a bit of a cult following for these things. So I'm gonna show you why I love it and why I ended up keeping it for a year, even though I was only supposed to have it for two months. Um, you join us in a very strange undisclosed location in the UK. Uh, the usual place I come to film was shut, really annoying. So yeah, we'll see how we go. So here we have it then. This is a 2006 Saab 9.3 TID. So it's the diesel variant. It's based on the Vectra C platform. And you may well know that that is quite an old platform, especially for this age of car. But they did keep using it and they did do a lot of tweaks to it. Saab effectively were meant to just tweak a few things, put a different badge on it, and that was that. But actually, they rebuilt the car from the ground up to give you what you see here. Um, I was going to have this car for a few months, but actually, it turns out I had it for nearly a year, uh, sort of between getting other cars. So it's been quite a trooper for me. I've done about 8,000 miles in it. And yeah, I've really enjoyed the car and I'm going to show you a few reasons why it's unique and why actually it's probably one of the best value cars you can get for around a thousand pound nowadays. So as long as you find one with good history, they're quite reliable. Uh, they're based all on the Vectra platform so you can get parts for them quite easily. And they're quite well equipped for the price and overall one of the comfiest cars you can get as well. So there's a few sporty characteristics which we'll go through. So the majority of these were sold with the petrol engines and the engine variants that came in this, most of them were turbo variants. So they were a bit ahead of their time where that was concerned. So it tended to have a little bit more power than its rivals or just a slightly different power band to the equivalent BMW 3 Series of the time or anything of the sort. Um, so going around the car then, at the front, this is a Vector model. So this doesn't have the body kit on it, but I do have the Vector alloy wheels. So at the front, most of them came equipped with the projector headlamps, which is quite generous for this sort of car specification wise. But to be honest, they are a bit like candles. I would say that they're not really worth having the projector in there. They're not bright at all. I've been quite disappointed with their performance, but these aren't the um, Zenon HIDs in this particular model. So just bear that in mind. Um, and from side profile, this is the convertible model. So quite a nice profile, actually. They still don't look too bad today. Still look quite modern. And going around the back here, I always preferred the back of the saloon and the estate models personally, but this has grown on me a little bit. On the aero models, you would have an exhaust cut out as well. So as I say, I don't have the aero body kit on this particular car, but I do have the aero wheels, which do make a big difference. I much prefer these, especially side on to the other wheels involved. But where this car really stands out is the interior. First of all, you've got these nice door handles that pull upwards, a bit like the modern Audis. As we go inside, we've got this full leather parchment interior in this model, and I have the facelift interior. Any model from a 56 plate upwards, late 2006, has the facelift interior, so it's quite unique to get the older shape pre-facelift with the facelift interior, but it does make things a lot easier in terms of layout. You've got this kind of cockpit style with the center mounted ignition, almost like a fighter pilot. Saab were known for implementing a lot of aero stuff in their vehicles not only by name but also just in terms of the features involved so i'm going to run you through a few little bits and bobs rear leg room you can't see there you can only see my reflection which is handy so i'm about six foot and that's my driving position there so rear leg room is not perfect all right for kids you can fit an adult back there you can fit my mate steve back there but just about how would you say rear leg room is steve uh, well, for me, I'm a short, so it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm going to hop in the driver's seat, give you a little tour of the interior, and then we'll get on the road. And I'll tell you what I actually like about this car. I picked this one up for just over a thousand pounds, and I'm going to tell you why it was bargain of the century. So, the interior of the Saab, then. As I say, these seats are some of the most comfortable I've found in a car, actually. I think they're um, really great for standard seats. These aren't the optional electric models, but they're just as good. Interestingly, these head restraints, it's the Saab Active Head Restraint System. So in the event of an accident, your back would press against this portion and this would shoot upwards to protect you from getting whiplash. And unlike the BMW and Volvo systems of the time, you didn't have to replace the parts. They would just reset back to the standard position. So that was really great. And partly why this was one of the first convertibles to receive a five-star safety rating in the Euro NCAP. So interior-wise then, we've got a nice instrument cluster. We have the Saab night panel mode, which I will get to later on. Um, this is obviously the convertible model. 
but we do have some interesting Saab quirks and features in here. So, center mounted ignition. So that goes in there and the car comes to life. And you also have the Saab cup holder, which is a very strange, intricate design. I mean, not the most practical thing in the world, but it certainly looks cool in operation. In terms of interior space, not too bad. Definitely not as good as the saloon models, but overall, it's quite a nice place to be. Everything is focused quite heavily towards the driver, so everything's kind of angled this way, which is really nice. It does look a bit old-fashioned for the year, but you have to bear in mind that Saab was just basically going off what they could do with the Vectra C platform, and they redesigned the chassis of this convertible from the ground up as well. So let's get the convertible down. I'll show you that in operation. It's not the quickest nor the quietest, but it's fully operational, fully electric, which in a car worth around a thousand pounds, you can't really complain. Unfortunately, the British weather isn't doing great things for us today, but you will find you will get some use out of this here. I've, I've had many a day where I've used the convertible top and it's been really nice over the summer. So yeah, let's get the roof down and see what she looks like. So another little look around then with the top down. I definitely think the top down is what suits this car the most. And I really like the combination I've got here of the jet black metallic paint and the parchment leather interior. I think it's probably one of the better combinations in terms of specification. Um, yeah, I think it looks a lot better from the back with the roof down. Again, I mean, some people prefer it with the aero body kit, but that can get smashed up. It's all fiberglass stuff, so it's not the best. So I think I've got quite a good combination going on here. But yeah, for £4,000, not a bad bit of kit at all. You can get your summer fun out of it. As I say, this one being the diesel, it's not quite as punchy or as fun as the petrol variants, but it gets the job done. And I think personally, it does look all right today. It still looks a bit more modern than the kind of equivalent BMW 3 Series convertible at the time and its other rivals. So yeah, not bad at all. So you join me inside the Saab 9.3 convertible and as I said this trim that I have here is the 1.9150 which is a turbo diesel, same one that you would have found in the likes of the Vauxhall Zafira of the time, the Vauxhall Vectra of the time, the Vauxhall Astra of the time, pretty much anything General Motors. Um, it, I think it's a bit better suited to the automatic if truth be told. Um, I, I've got the manual here and it's a bit of a lazy revving engine. It likes being driven at low RPMs. There's a lot of turbo lag, boost kicks in at sort of 1700s and you really get a shove of torque. So it is quite capable, but not the sportiest to drive. So you could also get this car with the two litre turbo, uh, one that was badged a 1.8 litre turbo, but in fact was another two litre turbo in several different trims in terms of power range. And there was also a 2.8 litre V6 turbo with around 275 horsepower, which is definitely the one to go for if you're looking for something a little bit more on the lively side. Now, I suppose at the time this would have gone against the BMW 3 Series, the E46 convertible and saloon and so on, and also the Audi A4 at the time period. Uh, in terms of interior quality, I think the A4 uh, definitely looks a little bit more modern, but I think this is a more comfortable place to be. And also I think in terms of the BMW, Definitely a more dynamic car, definitely a sharper drive when it comes to the steering, which we'll go on to in a little bit. But I think this has kind of held better value, really. I mean, in terms of value for money, I mean. So you can pick one of these up for sort of between a thousand pound and three thousand pound for a good one. E46s, they hold money a little bit more than that. But cruising along down a country lane here, it's a perfectly serviceable car. At the end of the day, there's enough torque in this engine being a diesel to give you a bit of shove. As I say, it's not really a sporty driving dynamic.
Yeah, I definitely think that the gearbox, in terms of a manual, will be better suited to the two-liter turbo petrol, just for a sportier drive. In terms of the chassis, they did actually rework this completely from the Vectra C, so especially for the convertible as well, they put a lot of money into it. And there's not an awful lot in the way of body roll either, so that's not too much to worry about. I was quite surprised by that. And something that's interesting about Saab as well is the re-axis rear wheel steer system. Now, it's completely passive, so it's not something that you'll really notice, but Jeremy Clarkson once famously said that it's almost impossible to crash a Saab, and I kind of get where he's going with that. You don't really experience too much understeer, and with the rear wheel steer system, it effectively adjusts the toe position of the rear wheels based on what the cornering habits are. It works quite well, surprisingly. It, you don't notice it all the time, it doesn't work all the time, and it is very minute in terms of a, a change, but it's enough for you to know it's there, and it's enough for it to feel a bit different from its rivals. Now, of course, a rear-wheel drive BMW is gonna be more dynamic, it's gonna be more fun, you're gonna be able to get the tail out and that kind of thing, but if you're looking for a country cruiser, this does fit the bill, and these comfortable seats make all the difference. Now, I'm not hammering down this road, I'm just cruising nicely. If we go into slightly higher revs, you do get some induction sound, you hear the turbo whistle. It's nice enough whilst not being intrusive and it's not too clattery for a diesel either. It's not like I've been in a 320D and that was kind of a really, really harsh place to be. It's a very kind of transit van. This one, not so much. I definitely wouldn't put it at refined. If you're looking for refined, go for a petrol. That goes without saying. But. It's a good compromise, especially if you're using this as a daily, you want to get 35 mile per gallon around town and 45 to 50 on a run. So what do you get then for your thousand pound? Well, you get a nice comfortable interior, you get a decent choice of engines, you get quite a bit of standard equipment. It comes with the Saab SID, which is basically like a glorified check control system, which kind of enables you to kind of see what's going on with the car. It gives you lots of warnings about bulbs being out and coolant level being low and so on, all the usual goodies. So it's quite sophisticated for its time, especially as it's based on quite an old chassis. Interior quality is quite good. So you've got sort of plus squidgy materials down here. You get a few creaks and rattles now that it's getting on a bit, but nothing too bad and nothing uh, groundbreaking. I'd say potentially the rivals are a little bit roomier, but I think you get an all-round decent package in here and a few Saab quirks and features that are really worth having in my eyes. I really love the night panel mode which takes away all the distractions on the instrument cluster at night and I really also enjoy reversing <laughs> and I do enjoy the quirky if not almost unusable cup holder and I also really like the centre mounted ignition all very fighter pilot style. Now you can definitely tell that there are some General Motors parts in here, but luckily the worst bits were left out. This gearbox, for example, is the six-speed, but it's the one they use in the Vectra and the Signum, not the M32 unit that they used in the Astra that was known for blowing up every five minutes. I did think when I first got this car that it would be a really kind of floaty experience. I expected it to be a bit of a boat. I mean, this one, for example, being the convertible, this is the equivalent length of a new BMW 3 Series. It's quite a big car, and for some reason, the gentleman who ordered this one from factory decided that he could afford leather seats but not parking sensors. So it can be a bit tricky in tight spaces. Visibility is good, I'd say, for this class of vehicle, but not great, and of course, having no rear wiper doesn't help, but that obviously differs in the saloon and the state variant of the car. And there's definitely a bit of a cult following for these. There's quite a young community modding some of them still, but equally so, there is a much older community of grandpas who just want a nice, easy going, cheap to run car, basically. When we was on our way to film at this location, we stopped off in a shell garage and there was a fella in front of me who had a petrol version of this car in this same granddad specification, the cream leather interior and the black outside and he was about a million years old and it kind of got me thinking well yeah i mean that is kind of the stigma you get with one of these but at the same time it's quite nice not having to race boy races at the lights you can just cruise along do your own thing and there is also the aspect of well it's fast enough but it's not crazy fast i'm chatting down a country lane at the moment i get to enjoy swinging between the gears gearbox is quite a decent throw on 
it's a little bit notchy. Um, I mean, I could do with the gear linkages being done on this one. It's quite a common thing. They're a bit, there's a bit of slack there, but it's not too bad. But, you know, if you slow down, chuck it between the gears. I'm, I'm at sort of 2K at the moment, so turbos are spooling up. Bit of a shove of torque. It's not too bad. I mean, it's not fantastic, don't get me wrong. 150 horsepower in a car this size and weight. It's not going to win any races, but it's enough. And the good thing about a lower powered car is you can have some fun with it. You know, I can go down a country lane like this. I've been down this same road when I was doing the review of my Cooper. If you go on my channel and look back at that, I couldn't unleash the full potential of the car here. It was, you know, the road's too narrow, it's too short, there's too many twists. With this, I can stick my foot right in the carpet, really eke it out, and it just cracks on. You know, you can have some fun with it. You can really bring it out. You can take it to the limit. And of course, I would be having more fun if I had a petrol one. I could take it to red line. It wouldn't run out of oomph. One of the thing is with this engine is, it doesn't really like being revved out, of course, being a diesel. But not only that, it's quite lazy to drop the rev. So if you're looking to down change, it just feels a bit lazy. You, you change up a gear and you can't slam it between the gears. You know, it's gonna drop quite slowly. It's quite a lazy car in that respect. It's really in its element when you're pooling around town below 2,000 RPM changing gear. You're gonna experience great economy and, and all that kind of thing. But knowing what this chassis feels like and knowing what the steering's like, it's a bit vague on center of the steering, it can be. It's a bit floppy. I've done the universal joint on this one because that's very common for the bushings to fail and that kind of thing. So you end up with steering play and stuff like that. Luckily, this one's been resolved. But yeah, it's knowing what it's like, I'd really love to have a go in a petrol one, especially that V6. I think a drop top with the V6 noise, that extra power, that extra torque, maybe even with the auto box, just because it's a smooth cruiser. I'm sure it would suit the manual okay as well, but honestly, I think maybe with the diesel, uh, it's hard to say. I think the auto box may be a bit better being a sort of a traditional torque converter. I mean, you don't see many reviews of these cars nowadays. They're few and far between. People are scared off a side because it's old, outdated. The company's gone under, you don't see them anymore. But they're hidden gems, I think. For this sort of money, I paid like just over a thousand pounds for this car. I've had a year's usage out of it. I can enjoy it on a country lane. I can enjoy it on a run. It's a comfortable place to be. There's loads of quirks and gadgets that people get in. You know, everyone's always fascinated by the ignition when they get in and, and, the, and the weird cup holder and all the usual Saab quirks. It's just a nice place to be and it's, how can you go wrong at that money? You can still get plenty of parts for it, it's all voxel stuff. If you're looking for something cheap, just as a run around or even a bit of summer fun, you can't go wrong with one of these. If you get the two litre turbo, you can mod it almost like you would an Astra VXR. Get 300 plus horsepower out of it. Imagine that, imagine taking one of these on track, stick some coilovers on it. I mean, what a cool project for that sort of money. It might not be the most dynamic car in the world. It might not be quite as good as the BMW in the Benz, but trust me, it's worth a thousand pounds. Go out and grab yourself one, or at least have a go in one before they go extinct. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I'll see you very shortly in the next one. I apologize for the shaky camera work in this video, by the way. I've been through a few camera mounts. It's not looking good. Please like, subscribe, consider hitting the bell, comment, share, all that good stuff. And I'll see you very soon for the next one. Bye-bye.